there were periods in my life where I wasn't stopping to see the signposts. I wasn't, I don't, I wouldn't even call it an effort. I would call it more of just um, acknowledging the consciousness that enables us to see those things. And I think the dream world, the spirit world for me, was guiding me all along. Hey, everybody, it's Christine, your host for the Rose Woman podcast. And I'm going to open today by reading a poem, part of a poem by Khalil Gibran, written over a hundred years ago, called On Marriage. At the end of this episode, you're going to hear how this ties into the story that Emmanuel and Laura are sharing with us. I, you shall be together, even in the silent memory of God, but let there be spaces in your togetherness, and let the winds of the heavens dance between you. Love one another, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. Fill each other's cup, but drink not from one cup. Give one another of your bread, but eat not from the same loaf. Sing and dance together and be joyous. But let each one of you be alone, even as the strings of the lute are alone, though they quiver with the same music. Give your hearts, but not into each other's keeping, for only the hand of life can contain your hearts. And stand together, yet not too near together, for the pillars of the temple stand apart, and the oak tree and the cypress grow not in each other's shadow. I mean, as a model for relationship, it's pretty beautiful. hundred years and still valid. So I was really fortunate to be invited to speak at a program in Ibiza, Spain, called the Holo Movement Wave. And the Holo Movement was founded by our guest today, Laura Rose and Emmanuel Kunzelman, with a core desire to tie people together who are working on projects to uplift and connect humanity. Uh, They've been doing service work for their whole lives. They're very special, mystical people grounded in science and action on Earth. They are really living the integration of the material and the spiritual in a way that few people are. So they invited me to come and talk on this topic of my graduate research, Living from Oneness, the new global Gaian movement that's returning us to our bodies and to Earth. And I had such an amazing experience meeting the people in that community who are to a one inspired and activated. And I was also inspired by seeing these two in action, both in the quality of their relationship, in the humility and kindness they bring, and the evident long arc impact of their work, all of the projects that they had touched, and the deep love that was shared between them and many of the people present. So I invited them to be on the show to talk about those topics, their arc of how they became this couple in purpose and service, and the projects that they're working on now. And I hope that you enjoy the stories and insights and moments that have such applicability for how we all can live in more truth and beauty and connection and do great work in the world. So this is the first time I tried to interview a couple on the show. And they were very gracious about switching back and forth, but it gets a little janky here and there, so bear with me on that. I start by asking them how they met, how they recognized each other, and to tell the story of their couplehood in service. Well, we met um, in 1990. We were both at a cultural exchange industry conference. It was rather unique circumstances. I won't go into a lot of detail right now, but let's say that the cosmos kind of went out of its way to put both of us in (laughs) each other's vision. We had a rather mystical experience. Uh, We met uh, on a bus going to the pyramids of Teotihuacan in Mexico City. And uh, I think it was really meant to be 
I got there early for the bus ride, and the, it was a big conference, and there was like four thirty buses, and I decided to kind of douse, and I got a download that this was the most important decision. I had extra time, so I should find the right bus in the right seat <laughs> in the right place to sit, because something special was going to happen. And so I did, and Laura came on the bus and sat down next to me. And we went off to the pyramids. I climbed the pyramid of the sun. She climbed the pyramid of the moon. And uh, energy started to happen. We got back on the bus to go to Mexico City. There was a terrible traffic jam. And the bus driver said, well, we're not getting anywhere right now. We might as well stop at Pyramid Charlie's Bar and sample some tequilas on the way. <laughs> and so we did. And then we got back on the bus after that. And Laura, being her usual vivacious self, was trying to get me to be a little more talkative. And she said, well, just tell me what turns you on. What's your passion in life? What excites you most? And I said, okay, well, quantum physics. <laughs> and uh, she asked for a little explanation on that. I had no idea what quantum physics was in the 1990s. <laughs> she was particularly moved by the story of interconnectivity and Bell's theorem of the instantaneous connection between particle physics beyond space and time. And when I told her that, I think there was a deep cosmic connection established. So you were sort of quantumly and entangled from the beginning. <laughs> we were definitely entangled from, from the moment we met. And I think even if a physical particle uh, accelerator separated us by many light years, we'd still be doing pretty much the same things in entanglement. So um, that was the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it took us a while. She lived in San Francisco. I lived in Madrid, so... We, we call that a geographically undesirable relationship. Precisely. Exactly. It, it was. Finally, one day, we were talking on the phone, and Laura said to me, you know what? You don't do very good phone. I, I think I'm going to have to move to Madrid. Was that, that was a strategic not doing good on the phone? Or, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, well, I, you know, I'm just not that good on the phone. I, 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 can't, I have trouble getting motivated when I can't see something. And it's all I got this receptor in my ear. Is, so even, uh, even in that story, you're sharing the love of travel. You're sharing the love of exploration. And obviously, a deep belief in the unseen. Exactly. Even in the meeting. How about you? How do you, is that what you remember, Laura? You know, that story is very accurate um, in that um, all of those things happened. Um, we were both in this amazing industry called cultural exchange, which, um, which brought us together, and I'm very grateful for that. I knew before I left on that trip that something was going to happen. I didn't know what, but I knew that I was ready to kick my card table, if you will, and, you know, knock over that perfectly balanced house of cards that you spend so much time building, and then you get it just right, and you have the right job, and you live in the right house, and you live in the right place and in beautiful Northern California. But I wasn't happy, and I was ready to do something really different. And when I met Emmanuel on that bus, and um, we had the conversation about quantum physics and Bell's theorem in particular, I literally saw fireworks. It was like all of the things that I had experienced as a girl. I used to believe that there was um, like a veil or a curtain that was between me and the real dimension of reality. And I remember thinking, my parents had a beautiful garden that we in a house that we lived in for a while, and there were lots of butterflies and flowers. And, and I remember standing in that garden and thinking, if I could just lift this veil, I would see the real reality where things are much more perfect and much more cohesive. And somehow that experience on the bus, 30 years later, whatever it was, um, 25 years later, I think sort of was like, starting to lift that veil and saying, oh, yeah, you know, all the dreams I had as a girl, I had 
lots of prophetic dreams. And, and I just sensed that it was the right thing. And I remember flying back from Mexico City after we'd spent a few days together and just saying his name over and over again in the dark in this plane flying over the Pacific Ocean, and just saying, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, and just having this knowing that he was on an extraordinary path and that it was my destiny to be part of it and to help him carry out all the amazing things that he was envisioning, which became ultimately my vision. Mm. This lifting of the veil, that feels so real to me when you're speaking of it, like I can, I, I see you as a small child, kind of knowing and sensing that there's this unified field. And, and what an amazing gift. Do you still have that perception of tapping into things that are below material reality in your daily life? Frequently, yes. Um, and I, I feel so blessed, Christine, to have that in my life. You know, it, to me, it's such a, an extraordinary gift. There were periods in my life where I wasn't stopping to see the signposts. I wasn't, I don't, I wouldn't even call it an effort. I would call it more of just um, acknowledging the consciousness that enables us to see those things. And I think the dream world, the spirit world for me, was guiding me all along. And, and there was a, a dream that I had when I was about 25 or so that I th was one of the the signpost for me. And it was, um, you probably are old enough to remember I Dream of Jeannie. Yeah, of course. Remember that, that program? And how she lived in the little bottle and how cute that little bottle was inside. It was kind of, mm -hmm. had the little velveteen settee seatings around it, right? And well, I dreamt that I was in a spacecraft going past Jupiter and Saturn and Mars and looking out the window as these incredible planets and stars were sailing by. And I was in this I Dream a Genie-like capsule. And it was beautiful on the inside. And I thought I was alone until I turned around and realized that there was this very ancient, wizened woman sitting on the other side of the, the capsule. And she was looking at me with very soft gaze, but quite intently. And I turned to look at her, and I thought, she looks so familiar. Who is she? And then she began to tell me about looking for signs in life and being aware of the signposts that the, the world gives to us. And as we spoke, and I thought, oh, she's so, she's so wise, and she's so gentle and soft. And then as I gazed at her longer, I thought, oh, she's me. Oh, but she's really, really old. She's like, <laughs> she's like 90 or something. And, but she was beautiful. And she was just telling me, you know, it's all going to be okay. And there, the universe, this unified field of beauty is there. And if you look for it, you'll see it. And after that, I think it was when I really started reading those signposts and recognizing symbols and so many things like butterflies and hummingbirds and pulsing. I think time folding back in on itself and having a visitation from your older self is pretty fantastic. Yeah, it was lovely. You know how sometimes there's this exercise where you imagine you're 90 and you write to your younger self mm. from that wisdom place? You can kind of tap into that. It's quite amazing to have it happen spontaneously. So, so here you are, the two of you in this wonderful space. It sounds like even if you're in cultural exchange to begin with, you're already poking at the bear of unifying human society. So even from a very young age, you were doing that. Yeah, I would say so. I felt I had a calling from a very early age. My first epiphany when I was six, seven years old, sitting in an apple tree, the teacher at school, I think I was in first grade, had told us that the, the population of the earth had reached three billion people that day. And she wrote the number on the blackboard. It seemed like a very huge number. I didn't know even know what it meant, but I went home. It was in the spring. The apple tree was in bloom. It was this beautiful day. I climbed up in the tree. I'm looking through the apple blossoms at the crystalline blue sky behind it. And I, I just had this epiphany 
that, you know, back then I was kind of more of a raised a Catholic, so I use more theological terms, but it just came to me, I thought, boy, God, if God went to all this trouble to create individual beings like yourself, then you better live up to it. You, you've got to do something. You've got to be of service to humanity. You know, you can't waste this opportunity. From that point onward, I was kind of a weird kid, but I always felt that my mission was to just be of service to uniting people and helping us understand each other and work together uh, to create a better planet, a better human society for, for everyone. And uh, pretty much my whole life has been dedicated to that from, from that early age. Uh, cultural exchange was a wonderful right livelihood to do that, uh, facilitating exchanges for people to get to know each other and different cultures and peace building. Uh, but now what we're doing today with the Holo Movement is kind of cultural exchange 2.0. We're, we're moving beyond exchange programs and just trying to be, bring people together anywhere and any way possible and, and serve the whole. Uh, certainly, our society certainly needs it. So we're, we're in service to that. Yeah, I feel that uh, bubbling up that's happening too. When I was looking at your combined bios, there were so many ways that you have been working on this unity question, even before the HOLO movement started. So maybe we could talk a little bit about those different applications. I saw youth programs, I saw girl empowerment, green and sustainable, alternate farming. I mean, so many things. Is there a unifying theme between those? And do you, do you each have different priorities within that? Or how, how does that structure for you? Well, there's certainly a unifying theme through all of it, which is providing opportunities for everyone on the planet, for youth, for marginalized people, for different cultures around the world, to have the opportunity to experience how extraordinary it feels when we go beyond simply fulfilling our own desires, which is a wonderful thing. I mean, how privileged are we to be able to, you know, those of us who can, to uh, make the decision to be a great dancer, a great singer, or a great, great at meditation, whatever it is that we're doing. But there's also this remarkable feeling that comes from working with other people when you see their dreams come true, when you see them shining so brightly and one of the things that we started doing at Greenheart, which really lit me up for years, was we've started providing opportunities for international young people who were coming to principally to the United States from about 85 countries around the world. We would introduce them to volunteering. It sounds odd, but we would insist that they had to try volunteering, which for a lot of them was anathema to what they had grown up with, the idea of working without pay was something they couldn't even conceive of. And we would say, look, you don't have to try it for very long, but give it a shot for just a half day. If you don't like it, you don't ever have to do it again, but just see what that feels like. And we had this, this program on our website that was called Greenheart Club. And the participants could log in, and there was a, a big white heart on it. And when they logged in... Every time they logged an hour of volunteering, the heart would fill with a little bit more green color. And with a hundred hours, the heart was fully green. And at that point, they were eligible to apply for grants, Green Heart Impact grants called GIGS. And we gave hundreds of those grants to young people all over the world. Um, some of the things that we facilitated were providing fresh water, drinking water to a school that had no running water in northern Colombia, and building a playground for children in Jamaica, and starting a reading library in Gambia. And these were all students who said, this is a dream. This is what my community needs in this little corner of the world. And if you could give me just a small amount of money, I can make it happen. And then we started taking those kids to Washington, D.C., and introducing them to members of the Department of State so they could truly see the value of providing visas 
to young people from all over. And they would then, in turn, I used to give some public speaking classes, and those kids would then get up in front of a huge group of diplomats and politicians and give these poignant talks on the impact that had been made upon them by learning about another culture, volunteering, realizing that they could take issues that seemed insurmountable to themselves prior into their hands and actually solve them by having the belief and the support from someone else. It's so beautiful. It also sounds like the volunteer experience kind of trains a lens or a way of looking that helps you identify what's needed. Absolutely. Like you're with people and you see it, and not only do you see it, but now you feel you have agency. Someone has to do it, and it's not someone out there. That someone's you. Yeah, I think it opens up a new door of the joy that one receives through service to others. Uh, we're so culturally conditioned to our own survival and our own well-being that uh, we think, you know, we're oriented to thinking that everything is about us and for our own good. But the minute we start serving others and see how that builds relationships and see the light in their eyes when we help them out, all of a sudden it, it opens that door to a new sense of joy that we've helped someone else experience joy. And that's such a deeper and more profound sense of true joy coming from true love in our hearts of giving to others that it's, um, it's a completely different experience. And when young people do that for the first time, I, I think it's very fulfilling for them. Yeah, there's a, a feeling of collaboration within it too. And isn't that part of it? There's not a hierarchical transfer when you're doing it from the heart. You're actually going hand in hand, and that's got a different feeling than the rescuer vibe. Yeah. Do you know? Exactly. Like there's a difference between volunteering, allying, joining, and sort of being the savior. You mention in your writing that making a difference and motivating people to take action is sort of a, a shared purpose you both have. I want to explore that a little bit. Do you find that people don't know what their purpose is when you first meet them? And how do you help people find their purpose and identify where they can make a difference? That's such a good question, Christine. Well, I've worked with so many incredible young people over, over the years. And several, several of them I've spoken to recently who have gone through uh, stages where where they've had the self-doubt that we all have, right? We all go, go through these moments. But I think one of the most profound examples is um, a young woman that I've worked with for years who lives in Ghana. And she started out with us as this bright-eyed, sparkling, beautiful young woman who arrived from Accra in the United States, started volunteering, realized that she loved nothing more than to giving back to other people. She went back to Accra and she applied to us for a grant to train some village women that by picking up plastic around the straight uh, plastic that had been thrown out, you know, and just left kind of lying everywhere, that if they were to pick that up and turn it into art projects, that they could make something beautiful. So they were making everything from little flower vases to purses to all kinds of wonderful pencil holders and selling them successfully. And they were also leaving their village absolutely beautiful. Then she went on, Timotina went on to get married. She went on to have a baby. She went on to do a lot of extraordinary things. And she got a job at a bank. And she started moving up the ladder and was exceedingly successful. But she got in touch with me just recently and she at first, she had that bright smile that she always has, but as we talked a little bit longer, she said, you know, I'm really not happy right now. And what I realize is that I've got this beautiful daughter and a beautiful husband, but I have a job that's not fulfilling me. And so we started talking about what was it that really made her happy. And she said, 
And it, she's answering her own questions. I mostly just ask questions. I rarely plant the seeds of any suggestion. But uh, what she said is, when I'm happiest is when I can actually do for others. And she made the decision in that call that she was going to cut back on her hours at the bank and start doing more in community work and service for others. And she's extraordinarily uh, excited now and just got in touch with me saying that things have shifted incredibly just in a few months. So that's just one example. It, it sounds like you trust that people have the answer, though. Many. They know inside of themselves somewhere, even if they're unwilling to, even if it's not visible at the moment. Yeah, they do. Everyone has a purpose, uh, a divine purpose to unfold in their lives. Mostly our cultural conditioning covers that up for us. And we're pressured to get a good job, make money, be successful by society's terms, not by our own terms. So we end up working in a bank or doing a job that really isn't our purpose. But we feel like it is because that's what society demanded of us. But if we can be true to our own inner vision, what makes us happy, what we're good at, what we love to do, and find that and find work in those lines, then our purpose is revealed. But it, it's not, you know, it doesn't jump into being. People are saying, well, I can't find my purpose. Well, it's like climbing a mountain or something. Just find the trailhead, you know, <laughs> and, and follow it and keep on trekking and developing it. And little by little, it will come out. And purpose is an ongoing project. It's ever unfolding and ever evolving. So my purpose, it, my stage in life continues to evolve. So it's not like one day you don't have a purpose and the next day you do. It's, it's always there, but it's your life career. It's the driving force of what you were meant to do in this life and what can most fulfill you in service to humanity. And little by little, if you're just open to that inside yourself, it'll come forward. Yeah, when I was little, um, you know, my father was in the go to get a job in the bank category. I, I believe I knew my purpose. And I was directly told that if I did that, that I could not count on tuition support, and I better study economics, you know, or something like that. <laughs> so when I had children, I did something completely different. I took them to everything, every activity possible, and then watched where they would drop into the flow state and then keep taking them to that. So by the time they were 11, 12, they knew exactly what they wanted to be. My son said, we're, we're, I had this one very clear conversation. They're all in the back seat. And my oldest says, I, I want to be a writer or an actor because they make people feel things. And my daughter said, I want to be a fashion designer so that I can help women feel beautiful. And my other son said, I want to be a fertilizer magnate and have five kids and an apple orchard. <laughs> you know, like they were just, they were just like so clear at 11 and 12. And, um, and they all did that, basically, not the fertilizer magnate part. That was a borrowed story from some other person who is like a father of a local kid. But he did do something similar, and he built an apple orchard basically for himself. And I, I think I think that guidance um, sometimes can come from sitting in a tree and hearing God speak to you, or seeing the flowers and knowing that your job is to reveal it, reveal that underlying force. But there are, in many indigenous traditions, ways that you're guided into your gift, and reawakening that in the parenting phase would be amazing. Well, every every young child should ha be so fortunate to, to have a mother like you, Christine, who who sees the flow and allows them to to find that. And that's a beautiful story. Well, like you, Christine, my dad uh, wanted me to be a well, not a banker, but an attorney. <laughs> oh. oh, I can't even imagine you as an attorney. <laughs> I mean, I know you have a very sharp mind. <laughs> you're very you're very sharp. <laughs> The velvet glove part. I've never heard an attorney who talks like caramel. <laughs> but there's um, a, a beautiful woman who was with us. You may have met her. Um, who was with us at the, the Holy Movement Wave in Ibiza. One of the things I love, her name is Laura Pena, and she's the founder of this wonderful girls' empowerment platform. She's just an amazing young woman. And 
what she says to the girls that she works with is, what is it that makes you cry? You know, when you're looking for your purpose, what really grabs your heart? What just pulls at your heartstrings? That's when you know that you've really found something. And I remember going to that law library at um, UC Boulder where I went to school and spending a day there. I thought, okay, Dad, I will give this a try. So I looked at the stacks and stacks of books and I thought, this may make me cry, but for the wrong reason. <laughs> so, you know, and it wasn't until I hosted a kid. This was before I met Emmanuel, and I was living in San Francisco. And I would always, I was already working in cultural exchange, and I would always take the last voice. I could, I could host up to two kids at one time, and I would always take the last two, the ones that nobody wanted. And who was, I was always imagining their parents sitting in Spain waiting, you know, for the news to which host family is going to choose my son, and thinking how terrible I would feel if I were the mother of those adorable boys, so I would take the last kid. And it invariably it turned out that they were the most extraordinary <laughs> young people and had so much enthusiasm and joy. And you have to think about a kid who's 15 who's willing to get on a plane and fly halfway around the planet to live with somebody that they have never met before, and then sink into their lives, adapt to their food, adapt to their lifestyle, and then uh, ultimately become a part of your family. I mean, how cool is that? You know, and, and we, Emmanuel and I did a count not long ago with our team at Greenheart. We're kind of phasing out of that part of our lives. But we have now, with the help of an amazing village of, of staff and volunteers and local coordinators. We've now facilitated the experiences of cultural exchange experiences of over 170,000 young people from 85 countries around the world. It's jaw-dropping. Wow. Uh, it really makes me smile, you know, just how many friendships have been made, how many babies were born out of the union of, you know, different people from different countries coming together, sharing their languages, sharing their traditions, sharing their cultures, learning to love one another. And, you know, so many American families, Christine, who would tell us, oh, yeah, I'll host. I need to teach people about being American. <laughs> and, you know, at the end, honestly, I, I honestly think the families that, that hosted these students changed more, grew more, had more exceptional experiences, and had their hearts opened even brought more, more widely and more broadly than the, the young people that they brought in. I want to just comment on your choice to pick the last kids, which to me is such an integral part of who you are, that no one is left out, that everyone belongs, that in, the, in this field, everyone belongs. My uncle and his wife had an old Victorian in Milwaukee near the university, and they, they did not have a single semester where there weren't exchange students living in their house. And so 30 years they did that. You're, you're absolutely right. They were utterly changed by hosting those people. I, I remember being behind a school bus and the little stop sign coming out so that the children could walk across the street safely and watching all the traffic stop and being overwhelmed with this unexpected mercy of protecting the most innocent. And that that is a pointer to what I'm here to do, um, to find that little extra moment of compassion in your life for the people who aren't being protected. I want to talk about science and spirituality and the blend of the two, the holo movement, you want to jump into that? I, I think there's been a false split between the material or the scientific and the spiritual, and you seem to be really going at the heart of that split. I mean, we can see in today's world that we're very divided in so many different ways. We won't even mention politics. Science and spirituality are completely separate, two different worlds. And uh, there was a quantum physicist named David Bohm, an American physicist, and uh, he saw things differently. And he saw the universe as one, unbounded, unlimited oneness. And he also developed what is today 
probably the most prominent theory of quantum physics. And he said there's an implicate order, the divine or source information that coded everything to make the universe happen. And what arose from that implicate order, the explicate order, is manifest reality. And although seemingly very different from the consciousness in our minds to a car going down the street, really everything comes from the same source. And for as different or inanimate as some objects may seem, uh, it's only a question of bonding, density, frequency, but it all comes from the same source, and it's all one. And Bohm said that what connects the implicate and explicate order is this constant, infinite flow that weaves them together, and he called it the holo movement. And therefore, for as different as things may seem, they are all one. So it arises out of that concept that the universe is interconnected instantaneously beyond space and time at every moment of every day, and it's all one. An individuated consciousness, the experience of being Emmanuel or Laura, how does he resolve that? Well, I don't want to speak too much for David Bohm on that. He was certainly very keenly interested in that. In fact, later in his life, he became a very close friend of Krishnamurti, and they had extensive dialogues on the nature of consciousness. Uh, Bohm was also a very good friend of the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama referred to David Bohm as his scientific guru. So he delved into that very deeply. But I would say, in interpretation of Bohm and my own thinking, that there's no such thing as totally individual consciousness. Um, we are all drops in the same ocean, and we know from the holographic nature of the universe that the ocean is also us. And it's really true. If we look at what holography is, you know, it shows us that extra dimension where we are holons. We are simultaneously our individual selves, and we are the whole. And the whole encapsulates us as part of the process. But in the long run, it, you know, our individual sense is enhanced and enlarged by giving service to and becoming part of the whole. We don't get lost in the cosmic soup as we serve and integrate into the whole, Quite the contrary. It helps us find more about our true nature and who our individuality is so that we can better serve. Uh, it seems like a paradox, but that one begins to be of service to the whole, then their true individuality is revealed to them, and the more they become themselves, they become the one self of all things at the same time. Yeah, that fits so deeply with the ancient tantric philosophies, that your job is to fully experience as a fragment of the Godhead, everything with your senses, be fully yourself, no one else can ever be in your position. And in that way, the whole gets to see all of these infinite combinations of its own self. It's like a, a the joy of playing in material reality is so that it can see the whole dance of everything, every possible combination, which is the way that the uh, ancient Indus Valley civilizations reconciled the oneness and the individuation. So I like that because it means your whole job is to live fully present in the moment as you. <laughs> Not, <laughs> yeah. No other requirement. Yay. <laughs> no redemption story possible. You don't need to be good. You just need to be you. And obviously that will be good. Does that resonate for you, Laura? Mm -hmm. Laura? I keep saying that like you're Spanish, Laura. <laughs> yeah. When there's kind of, there's two parts to me. There's kind of the Laura, and then there's the Laura. And Laura is a lot more fun. So you can call me Laura anytime. Laura, Laura. Sometimes uh, Laura has to have a chat with Laura and say, lighten up and enjoy life. So. <laughs> but, um, you know, for me, um, and, and I think for a lot of people, 
being told that we're all one is sounds really great, right? But it's it's hard to to get your head around. And sometimes quantum physics, as much as I love it and got lit up by it, I still don't really understand all of it. But what what has been so profoundly um, helpful in my life are are very simple examples that have been given by some ex- just amazing um, studies that have been done, like Rupert Sheldrake. You know, I don't know if you've read that wonderful book of his that is about how dogs know when their owners are coming home. And I love this. He's, he set up this whole study. And to me, this just says it all about science and spirit. And there's, there's dozens of wonderful examples of like this, not just of his. But he set up this whole study where owners of dogs that had a close relationship with their dogs, they would know that around 5 o'clock, um, the dog would be aware that the dog the owner was coming home. And so they kind of start dancing around the front door and getting excited. And um, Sheldrake said, well, I wonder if it's just, do they really kind of know what time it is? Or do they sense that the owner is coming home? So what he did was he set up this whole quite elaborate um, experiment where he put cameras in the offices of the owners of the dogs and then in the homes of the dogs, well, the, of the owners where the dogs were. And he would ask the owners to make a decision to come home at a different time of day. Instead of leaving the office at five, when the dog would automatically start kind of dancing around, he would, he would suggest that the owner would leave at two. And what they discovered is that no matter what time the owner got up from their desk, stood up from their desk and got the keys and put them in their pocket to go out the door, the dog would immediately leap up and start dancing around, and the camera was on it, no matter what time of day it was. And those are the kind of things that, to me, it just, they speak so strongly about the science and, and the blending of science and spirit. How many times, Christine, have you thought about somebody in the phone rings and it's them? Daily. Right? It's insane now. The synchronicities right now are out of this world. I is is that what he calls the morphological field? Is that part of that work? Well, he uses the term morphogenetic field. Is speci- um, he uses it with crystals? Yeah, and he specifically to say that the formation of crystals is already sort of predetermined some time out the shape that they're going to take. But there are beautiful examples. Well, the knowings that we've had, and you know, I'm sure. You, too, have had a prophetic dream. I dreamt years ago that my mother was reaching her arms up to me, asking me for help from a wheelchair. And uh, the next morning, I called her to see if she was all right. And she said that she had just been diagnosed with cancer. And she went through five years of treatment, and everything was fine. Five years went by, uh, the cancer metastasized, and she was in very bad shape, and I was at a hospital and um, with her. And she was wheelchair bound and she could no longer walk. And we were in the lobby of the hospital and I stopped the wheelchair for her to look at a gift shop and she turned to me and raised her hands and said, help me, help me, just as she had in a dream five years before. Exactly as in a dream five years before. To me, it's those kind of experiences that we've all had on some level, right? We've, whether it's a dream, whether it's a phone call, whether it's thinking about somebody and then running into them on the street, all of those things that you could call coincidence that are nothing. And there are no coincidences in life, as far as I'm concerned. There is only the needing of the blending of what I would call our, our unified field, is connecting all the time. And when we acknowledge that, that's when the beauty of of life, I think, really starts to shine. That's when we can give thanks for how exquisite our relationship is to the world. There's a a quote, I think it's one of my all-time favorites. It's by the, the Persian poet Hafez, the Divan. And he says, I wish I could show you when we're lonely, when you are lonely or in darkness, the astonishing light of your own being. To me, that just says it all. You know, the astonishing light 
of our own being, that we all have this light. Gonna hold that, just gonna hold that for a minute and like let it sink in. What is it? I wish I could show you the astonishing light of your own being. I wish I could show you when you are lonely or in darkness the astonishing light of your own being. Well, this takes us back to what you said in the beginning about the joy of uplifting others, right? (laughs) Just walking around and saying, look, you, another, another face of God, amazing. Or that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. So here you are together now working on this project. And, and it has a grand vision to unify all of these pods of people who are working on uh, bringing unity consciousness about in the world. That's how I would sort of sort of shorthand explain it. People who are aware of the implicate order and in the very ex- explicate and deliberate <laughs> way trying to put that to work in the world and, and making sure they know about each other. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. The important thing here is that the whole movement as a sociological phenomenon is a movement. We're proposing it as a movement of movements. So it's not an entity. No one owns it or controls it. We're trying to give it a boost to get it up and running, but it's a a circle of partnerships and collaborative links that are expanding and growing outward. But we just want to give people a sense of identity Uh, There's so much going on out there, hundreds of thousands, millions of nonprofit organizations, um, but oftentimes working in their own silos. And we've often felt that if somehow people could come together and identify under one name, what's going on here? And so it's a proposal to just call this massive human effort that's emerging now to really make the great turn in human society and turn us back towards the truth, beauty, and goodness and the values in the human soul that we seem to have lost sight of a little bit in our materialistic society and uh, give them a chance to explain it to others. You know, what are you part of? The Holo Movement a movement of oneness, the movement towards the whole. And it can be very simple. It sounds complex, perhaps, but it's really quite simple and clear, I think. No, it feels clear. And one thing it does is elevates the visibility, both among the people already working in those organizations, but to the larger society of what truth and beauty is is already among us. It, it's encouragement and it's true French root giving heart. And I, I sometimes feel that the more organized party controls the message. And sometimes that's misleading about what's really going on. That sometimes the disparate, diversified field actually is bigger and greater than the noisier field. I feel this movement is part of letting people know that, this movement of movements. Does that make sense? That among among us are so many, so many working on these questions. Totally. I met so many people that I had no idea were out there, like Ben with Unity Earth. Mm. What a wonderful project. What a wonderful group of humans. Or Zenka. Um, I just invited Zenka to come and do a talk on her vision for AI in San Francisco. You know, just like really seeing how this web can be woven even more. Adam Apollo, what an amazing thinker. You have assembled some beautiful people to weave with, to play with. You know, Christine, a lot of it for us is, you know, we've assembled an incredible group of people that are highly talented. These are the people who... We believe, and there's so many more, where every day we and you are meeting more and more people that are just coming into our line of vision and providing an opportunity for the world to move from despair to joyfulness. And, you know, there's a recent Harvard study that um, just floored me that said that 36% of Americans are experiencing serious loneliness right now. And 61% of youth, which is 
to me so sobering and so deeply concerning. And that was really for me um, and us the inspiration for creating the Holo Movement was wanting to help provide people with some stepping stones to recognizing how beautiful the world can be when we're connected, when we're awakened to a social movement that is showing us, igniting our interconnectedness and creating inspired collaboration. And when we come together and we see what's possible, when we embrace the simplicity of finding joy in recognizing one another's gifts and talents and helping to support that. You know, the girls that, that, um, that I've worked with over the years and through organizations like Empowerment Collective and She is the Universe, the thing that they need and want the most is support. And that doesn't mean financial support. That means recognition that that they are ready to blossom and burst out into the world to do amazing things if only someone could open the door to an understanding of that. And that's what I think the Holo Movement can provide, is opportunities for people to create community, to find that we can, to learn that we can find resonance through, with sound, with dance, with music, with art, all of the things that make our hearts sing. If you are speaking to, let's take a couple of different populations, you're speaking to someone who's lonely and disheartened. What I've heard today um, a little bit is serve somebody. That's a good way to get out of that. Find a way to amplify truth, beauty, and goodness, to uplift someone else. Those are all great pathways. Sometimes when you're in that place, you don't know where to start. You know, you're, you're just so far removed from having anywhere to hook in to do that work. So do you have some suggestions for people who are at that end of the spectrum? They're just getting started. Well, one thing we're doing is uh, we've created an online platform uh, through Hilo. And so people can uh, go to holomovement.net and you can join our Hilo platform and create what we call a holon, which is a small group. We suggest that it be a minimum uh, of three individuals. So anyone feeling lonely, maybe they can reach out to two friends and say, let's do something together. Let's um, ask our local council to create more playgrounds in the park or you know, pick a project, something that you can do locally that's obtainable, that you can actually accomplish. Form a small group, and you can register as a Holo Movement Holon on Hilo, and then you can see all the other Holons. Uh, there are currently, I think, over 170. Some of them are fairly large groups. Some of them are very small. But you can communicate with other groups, and really what we're trying to do is create an ecosystem of support for people to make them realize that there are all kinds of holons of community action everywhere and you can befriend them and they can befriend you and all of a sudden the world isn't a lonely, desperate place, but it's one full of action and all kinds of people and ideas flourish and cross-fertilize each other in the context. So uh, that is the sort of structural essence of the whole movement that one can participate in. That's great. And then also you're, you're seeing the activities of other people. So it's also modeling just ways to jump in and engage. I think there was another platform that someone was talking about uh, at the conference, which allowed you to go in and sort of identify your purpose and also uh, find places like, what are you meant to do? Or how could you plug in if you didn't have an idea? I'm trying to remember who that was. Do you guys remember that? Well, probably you're talking about Zenka with the Holo Movement Purpose Lab. Purpose, Purpose Lab, Purpose Lab, Purpose Lab. That's right. Yes. So yes. either... Uh, come if you if you can grab a couple of acquaintances or friends or neighbors and come up with a project and join the join as a whole on or if you're not even sure what where to engage maybe purpose lab would be a good a good plug-in point 
Yeah, because that offers um, Purpose Lab is creating groups of 8 to 12 people starting in October for people who aren't even sure where they want to begin, right? So it's wonderful to start a whole on with a couple of other people if you've got something in mind, but sometimes you don't, right? You don't even know where to begin. Purpose Lab is providing a platform for people to connect with others who are looking for purpose too. And it's a wonderful opportunity to just start exploring what might be possible with people you may not know at all yet, but just connecting with them on that level of say, being with other people who are saying, I'm looking to, to find a purpose. I want to do something, but I, I really don't even know where to begin. So how about if we start here by just meeting and acknowledging that? And sometimes it comes with something as simple as gratitude, you know, just acknowledging, like, what is it that was really great today? It might just be my cup of coffee this morning was wonderful. You know, that was a really nice way to start. And just starting with a little gratitude can help. And then, you know, there's the wonderful feeling that comes from creating community, especially if you're feeling alone, um, knowing that there are ways to create a community and through Purpose Lab, one can. And then through that, um, there are. it provides a platform to start exploring and saying, wow, what could we do together? What is it, what's something that we could take on? And as, you know, one of my favorite, well-used and deservedly so quotes is Mother Teresa's, when she says, we're not all destined to do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. I think it's important to remember that purpose doesn't have to be about saving the world. It can be just making one person's day a little brighter. So starting out small is a really good place to begin. We call that walking, living as a walking blessing for you. Mm-hmm. We call that, hey, you know what my job is? It's just to walk around as a, as a walking blessing field. That's all I'm here to do. <laughs> I love and that. that's enough. I'm just here to, like, you know, I don't know what form it's going to take. That is a, that's attributed to Patrick Connor. I love that we now have a place to start if you don't know your purpose, and we have a place to start if you've got an inkling or an idea. And also this broader encouragement of how to make the world a better place and for the deep journey that you've both been on. 34 years, huh? Yes, that's right. That you two have been doing this dance? (laughs) What are your hot tips for a 34-year devoted dance? Well, have sex in places other than beds occasionally. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I think part of it is, Christine, is um, I really think that a relationship that has purpose is sustainable or is much more likely to be sustainable. Um, you know, people have said to me over the years, how can you work with your husband every day? Good God, I mean, that must be impossible. And we have some keys to marriage maintenance. I think one of them is even if you have a purpose, it's your, you know, a common purpose, which I, I think, you know, if you have something to talk about at dinner, after years and years together, because you're you're creating, you're exploring, you're continuing to dive into new potential. That's always helpful. But you also need time away from each other. And even though we spend a lot of time together, we also have our time apart. For example, I could have easily worked, we, we live mostly in Madrid, and I could have easily worked from home all those years. But I actually walked every day to an office that was 20 minutes away to work with some friends. And so I could just come home at the end of the day and say, how was your day? <laughs> so, um, you know, it's important to give ourselves a, ourselves a little space too. Really, if one is fortunate enough to sense a sense of openness and evolutionary will in their partner, because uh, for a loving marriage and relationship to last 10, 20, 30 or more years, people change and hopefully evolve. And there needs to be, the two, the two people need to be on the same wavelength and evolve together so that they're in phase and they grow and they develop together. So I would just say, you know, 
L Laura and I were lucky enough to find each other, and I think we we evolved together. But but that's the important thing. Uh, partnerships break down when one person's evolving, moving on, curious, excited about life, and the other person is kind of dragging their feet and saying, well, maybe not, or going in a different direction, and then, then it creates that, that tension. So I just uh, encourage every human being on the planet to, to stick with the evolutionary wave and ride it and be brave and go forward, and your partner's there riding a surfboard next to you to help you along, and, and uh, you can go with that flow. And an important thing that we all need to remember is that there are going to be difficult times in a relationship. It's inevitable. And just to remind ourselves how much we love that person, deep down, how much we love that person. And is it really necessary to win? Is it really necessary to be right? Is it really necessary to allow oneself to get so frustrated over something that you give up all that love for wanting things to be just right? And, you know, we've, we've ridden a lot of waves over three, four years together. We've had some highs and we've been in a couple of troughs. I think we've both seen the importance in pushing through that trough and recognizing that there are better moments to come, just like there is every day in our own lives. You know, there are better days to come. And some are, sometimes when we're at the very bottom, we know there's nowhere else to go but up. That happens within ourselves and it happens within a relationship too. There's a, a songwriter out of Davis, California, uh, Laura Sandage. And I have not thought of this song in at least a decade until this moment. She sings, do you want love or do you want to be right? Do you want love or do you want to be right? Do you want peace or do you want to fight? <laughs> Celebrate or would you rather have an altercation? <laughs> and she's really speaking to like, it's a choice. It's a choice all the time. Yeah. You need to choose. And I'm going to choose love, baby. That's it. <laughs> Let's choose love. <laughs> exactly. It's a lot more fun. <laughs> Thank you both for everything that you do in the world. Thank you. So you see how we ended? And you remember the poem that I read at the beginning? You know, when Gibran is saying to be like the pillars of the temple, isn't that about living in shared purpose and upholding something that's greater than either of you could do alone? When they're talking about spaciousness, that's what he's saying when he's talking about the sea moving between you and growth, lifelong growth individually so that you're riding a similar wave. That's what Gibran wrote about with the cypress and the oak. So be inspired by that quality of relating. And for me, I'm really taking away some reminders to walk in truth and beauty and to uplift others and that no one gets left behind, and that we work to create this world that reflects the underlying unity of everything. If you're starting out, you might want to join Purpose Life. And if you already know kind of what you're here to do and you have some friends, maybe you want to go onto the holomovement.net and register a pod so that you can be inspired and cross-pollinate with other people. I'd love to hear what you're up to in the world, what you're creating, how you're amplifying the good, and, you know, as Gandhi said, being the change that you want to see in the world. So in a more peaceful world, I'm going to be more peaceful. I want a more joyful world. I need more joyful. I want a more sustainable and green world. I might make different choices in my own life. You know, full integrity. Please support Rosebud Woman, rosewoman.com, the intimate wellness company I started that makes beautiful intimate care and body care and reverent lifestyle products. And radiantfarms.us, psychoactive gummies for health and well being that are completely legal and completely effective. Radiantfarms.us. Okay, all love, all the time.